morning. Revelation chapter number 3. I want to say as you are, are finding your place here, the book of Revelation is, uh, is not as hard as a lot of people think it is if you learn how to rightly divide it and get, and, and get it and study it and pray, the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom in it. Here in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, the word church or churches is mentioned 19 times. 19 times in three chapters. From chapter 3, verse 22 on... In the book of Revelation, you don't find the word church until the very end over there. Something happens after chapter 3. We won't take time to get into that this morning, but it's in chapter 4, verse 1. A door is open, and a, verse, a voice comes saying, come up hither. We'll talk about that some other time. But anyway, it's church, 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 all the way through those first three chapters. Now... There are seven churches in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. The, the scripture on these seven churches has a double and very good possibility triple application. Number one, his message can be to any church at any time in any age in any country. Number two, these churches can represent different time periods in church history, and we call that a church age. Or number three, doctrinally, can apply to churches during the tribulation period, as John sees it. Now, uh, with, that, with that in mind, we're going to look at the seventh and final church here in the book of Revelation. And this, if you're going time frame, represents the last church age. If there's seven periods of church history, this is the last one. Look at verse... Um, uh, number 14, Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 14. And unto the angel, and it didn't say pastor, it said angel, of the church of Laodicea. The word Laodicea means rights of the people, the laity, civil rights, the rights of the people. Very fitting to a last generation church. Right, look what he says to this last church. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Does not mean God created him. That means he was the beginning of all creation. Verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods. This is God's description of the church in the last days. I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, that's an individual, and will sup with him, an individual, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne, in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And with that word, the word church is not found all the way through 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and parts of 19 all the way to the end. Notice chapter 1 ends with the word churches. Notice chapter 2 ends with the word churches. Notice chapter 3 ends with the word churches. There's more to That's not a coincidence. That is not an accident. 
God is saying these first three chapters of Revelation is a message to the churches. I want to take this last church, the church of Laodicea this morning, and I want to preach this morning on this subject, the great sin of American churches. The great sin of American churches. I do understand this morning that, that there are churches in the world that are going through tremendous persecution. There are churches in the world this morning that can fit either one of those seven messages to those churches. There are people being persecuted. There's revival going on in, in other countries, on mission field. People being saved by the thousands and churches. People being just swept into the family of God by a move of God's Spirit. There are church, people dying for their faith all over this world this morning in other countries. There are people that would give anything in the world just for that much of a copy of the Bible and they read it over and over and cherish it, love it, learn it, and die for it and buy it if necessary. There are people all over this world this morning that they're being beheaded, they're being put in prison, they're being starved. Look at the pe people in Sudan. Uh, they don't like to say, make a big deal of this on the news because it's not politically correct. But there are other religions, Islam in particular, that are killing Christians just because they're Christians and cutting their heads off. So this message this morning I'm preaching is the sin of American churches in particular. By way of introduction, I, this is not a doom and gloom message. I am for having fun. I am all for enjoying life. I do enjoy life. I, I have a great time. I, I thank the Lord for uh, that we have nice buildings. I love the, the air conditioning and the, the, the pews and the song books and the instruments and the quit. I, love, I mean, I appreciate it. I enjoy it. I'm not saying that you have to go around all the time uh, with your head down talking about how bad things are. You're not. Things are good. Things are looking up if you're a child of God. There's good hope for the future. But I want to tell you this morning, and we're, we're going to have to admit this morning that uh, uh, we, we got this idea in America that we pretty well got it made. We have nice buildings. We have people on staff and salaries and the pastor and the associate pastor and the associate associate pastor, the minister of music and the minister of youth and the minister of littler youth and the ministry of mammals and the ministry of papals and the piano player and, every, and there's so much money everybody gets salaries and lands and buildings and all of that. And, and we've got to the place where we're like this church where we think we're rich, we're increased with goods, everything's fine, let's just sort of kick back and take it easy. And that is the atmosphere you'll have in most churches in America today. I'm not talking about liberal churches where the pastor don't even believe the Bible. I'm, I, they're, they're apostate. Our problem is not apostate in, in, uh, in what we call uh, Bible preaching churches. It's, uh, it's apathy. Uh, the problem with uh, churches in America today, as far as real Christian churches, is not necessarily apostasy, it's apathy. There's a lot of apostasy. Apostasy means they don't even believe the Bible no more. I can preach on that Glide Memorial place up there and the, and the apostate churches that are accepting other religions and don't believe the Bible. That's another story. I'm talking about churches who claim to believe. Are you listening? Who claim to believe the Bible, who believe that Jesus is the Savior, who believe that He died on the cross who believe that he's the only way to God. That's what I'm talking about this morning. And apathy is this. You just don't care. You just don't care. You, you, have no, you have no burden. You have no, if it goes good, all right. If it don't, all right too. That's the sin of American churches. I asked this fellow one time, they said, uh, do you believe the greatest problems in America are ap ap uh, uh, apostasy and apathy? He said, I don't know and I don't care. And that's exactly the attitude, ignorance and apathy. And that means I don't know and I don't care. And ladies and gentlemen, this church here thought it was rich, but they had committees, they have clubs, they have groups, but lack spiritual heat. They have, they have increased with good, but knew not that they had poverty of heart. That's what I want to preach about this morning. I want to say a few things about it. Lukewarm. Here's what the Lord said to them churches. And, and ever, ever since I've been saved, it's hard for me to believe 
that he said that, but he did. He did. Uh, because our attitude is, well, I'd rather be lukewarm than cold. You know, that's not really the Lord's attitude. It's, to me, I don't, I don't uh, feel like that. I think if you do a little bit, it's better than nothing. And it is. That's true in some things. But you know what the Lord said? He said, I wish you was cold or hot. He said, I really wish that you'd just freeze and shut up or really be on fire for God because this lukewarm stuff is making me sick. That's what he said. He said, I'll spew it out of my mouth. You know, I can drink cold water. And I do every day. I drink. I didn't there in my office a while ago. I had a bottle of water and I drink. Man, I love it. And I can drink hot water. I can. And uh, because sometimes, uh, sometimes you're supposed to drink a good, good glass of hot water. It's good for you, system and everything. And but boy, that lukewarm. I mean, where it's neither cold nor hot. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just like drinking with spit. I, it just, just, uh, I mean, you just take that bottle, and you ever had one been sitting in your car about half the day, and you're real thirsty, and you just drink it, and it's the same temperature as whatever it is outside? That's rough. That's rough. I mean, I can do it, but you almost want to go like that, you know. That's what the Lord said. He said, I wish, I wish, uh, I wish you was cold. And uh, I would hate for, the, for us to talk to the Lord today and say, Lord, I want you to evaluate our church. And the Lord looked down and said, well, you make me sick. Wouldn't that be awful? That's exactly what he said the church would be in the last day. I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but I am determined by the grace of God. I don't want it to get lukewarm around here. I want it to be so hot around here. You, I mean, boy, you can smell the smoke and feel the heat, brother, and then feel the love of God getting you saved and getting you to Jesus Christ. I'm here tonight, brother. When you go to church, you ought to feel the power and the heat from the preaching. I mean, we've got a bunch of preachers that's scared to death they're going to lose their retirement. I've even heard preachers say that. Well, I've only got two or three more years, and if I say anything now, I'll lose my retirement, so I'll just be nice and pat everybody on the back. What a, what a scoundrel, man. I mean, what a crook. I mean, I ought to just fire him if they find out he feels like that. And get somebody that'll preach the Bible and the Word of God. It's lukewarm concerning sin. It was the coldness of churches in England that made John Wesley go outside and start the, church, the movement of the great Wesleyan Methodist movement and preach. It was the same thing that made General William Booth start apostasy and coldness in churches that made them start. You know, uh, this church here is conceited. Conceit is a disease that makes everybody sick except the person who has it. Uh, I'll say that again for you that are a little slow of thinking. Conceit is a disease that makes everybody sick except the ones who got it. You know what I mean? Say amen. Uh, there was a big fighter in this country uh, for years and years and years, and he was full of conceit. And uh, the Bible said pride goes destruction for destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. His name was Cassius Clay. And Cassius Clay, he changed his name because he tried to get, thought he had religion. Crazy, crazy, ridiculous. But old Cassius Clay, you know what he said in his day? He just died a few weeks ago. You know what he said? Cassius Clay, he's running and he said, there's not a man alive that can beat me. I'm too smart. I'm too pretty. I'm the greatest I'm the king. That's what he said. Quote. You know what he said? He said, if anybody ever dreamed they beat me, they'd wake up and apologize uh, for what they dreamed. And you know what the Lord looked down and said, y'all not talk like that boy. And the last, you saw in the last 20 years of his life, he watched somebody had to lead him around by the hand. You don't ever take this attitude of, I'm the greatest, I'm the best. You say, yeah, you, you will find out. God said pride goes before destruction and a Holy Spirit, like the Carolina Panthers did last year. I mean, it's, sports is full of this stuff. And God said the same thing to the, I said, come on, you with me, ain't you, man? Say amen. Come on now. Amen. I mean, somebody can leave lost, and that don't bother you a bit. Say something about the Tar Heels of Panther, people get upset. That's exactly what I'm preaching about this morning. Lord, help us this morning, brother. He, he, they're lukewarm. And I'm telling you, I've been to big, nice buildings. I've seen great big parking lots. Lord, have mercy. It looked like you was at Walmart. Stained glass windows, carpet that 
thick. That big old steeple reached to the clouds, brother, and everything just perfect. You walked in, there wasn't a piece of trash nowhere, and it just as cold and dead as 4 o'clock in the morning. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, beware, beware that a church don't get to where you just say, well, I go on Sunday morning, and I, I just go, and, you know, I don't, I don't really hate it, but I don't really like it. I mean, when I first got saved, I used to love to go to church. I was so excited. I wanted to learn. I read my Bible. Everything. I'm telling you, I just got it. But now, I just saw, you know what you are? You're neither hot nor cold. You are lukewarm. And I want to try to build fire under you this morning. Yeah, I've been to little old storefront buildings that didn't have a steeple and didn't have carpet and sat on metal chairs and God was all over the place. So God is not interested in buildings. Nothing wrong with them for you's right, but that's not what God's interested in. Ladies and gentlemen, we are lukewarm concerning sin. You can lie. You can cheat. You can steal. You can commit fraud. That's about any sin in the book and still be in good standing in a lot of churches in this country this morning. I'm telling you this morning, it doesn't matter what the liberal crowd says. It does not matter what political correctness says. It makes no difference what a politician said. What God said is right is still right, and what God said is wrong is still wrong. And you'll never have a church deviating from God's plan for his church. And you'll never have a church saying, well, we don't like all that. Uh, I, we get letters once in a while that said, why do you have to yell? And I'm like, Lord, I'm telling you, you know why? Uh, I don't know the definition of preaching. Isaiah 58, 1, in case you don't know that. And um, you don't have to, uh, but there ain't nothing wrong with it neither. Amen. One time I said, oh, why, does that, why does that preacher pray so loud? God's not deaf. And somebody said, well, he ain't nervous either. It don't, bother, it don't bother the Lord. He said, cry loud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a what? Somebody tell me. Trumpet. And show my people their transgression, not a kazoo. I mean, it'll pat people on the back like a trumpet. And God said that. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are lukewarm in this country. It's a funny thing to me that you can find, you can find time to do everything else in the world. Uh, I, don't get mad at me. I, I love y'all. A lot of these people, I don't even know your name. And you come every Sunday, and Sunday, I appreciate that. But I'm going to tell you something. If you only come to church Sunday morning, the only time you come to church Sunday morning, I'm not fussing at you. Thank God you do. I'm glad you do, and you should keep on. But if the only time you come to church is Sunday morning at preaching, you get one hour of church a week. That's 167 hours out there doing something else. You get one hour of church a week, and you will not stay fired up for God with one hour of church a week. You can't do it. I mean, listen, I go to church all the time, listen to preaching every day, and, and the devil fights me all the time. I don't want to get lukewarm. I want to be hot for God. Listen, your kids need to know what it's like. You say, well, my kid don't want to come, so I didn't listen. What are you going to do tomorrow when he don't want to go to school? What are you going to do tomorrow when she don't want to go to... If she don't like her Sunday school class, what's she going to do? Say, I don't like my teacher, Mama. You'll say, get up! Get down there. And then you'll go down there and have a meeting with the teacher and say, yes, 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 yes. Now, you respect her. That's what you'll do. I know how you do it. I mean, you have all respect for the world and the crowd. Don't dry up on me and don't get up and walk out because we'll everybody know I'm talking about you. Come on now. Help me out here. Come on. I'm telling you this morning, people, that's lukewarm. We need to get on fire for God. You say, well, I just want to go to church on Sunday morning and a preacher make me feel good. I, I, I might disappoint you a little bit. Now, sometimes you've got to feel bad before you can feel good. Sometimes you've got to feel medicine, take some medicine before you, you feel better. Ain't that right? I'm telling you this morning, we need to understand this. Let me tell you something to all you people with children. Studies show that 85% of your child's personality and traits are shaped by the time he's six. By the time your child is six years old, 80% of their personality is formed. That's the direction. It's like a tree. You bend the tree, it's going to grow that way. I'm telling you, it is important that they be under preaching and teaching and singing and feel and get to know God's Spirit. 
We've got to the place where we're like, it's no big deal if somebody gets saved. If somebody don't get saved. I heard the other day there's a man, woman, uh, went, took his wife to a baseball game, and it was up there in the stands like this. And she was sitting over there, and a guy hit the ball, and the outfielder ran across like that and caught it. He jumped up and went, Woo! How did you see that? And she said, Well, that's what I thought he was supposed to do. And I thought, man, that's exactly the way people are in church. I thought you were supposed to preach good. That's why I come here. You're supposed to. People are supposed to get saved. The church is supposed to just go on. Listen, it, you, it's taking it for granted, amen? That's right, taking it for granted. One church did this. Our annual report, they turned it into their denominational headquarters. Our, our annual report for this year is saved, none. Baptized, none. New members, none. Missionary support, none. Deaths, three. Finally at the bottom, pray for us that we'll continue faithful unto the end. And I'm going to tell you something this morning. There are churches all over this nation today that are dying. They're dying. The average age in them is 60 plus. And you go to average church this morning, they ain't no teenagers, and there ain't no little kids. In 20 years, them churches are going to be, they're going to be something else. Hand. There's churches with, that's turned into bars. There's churches that turn into nightclubs, and they call it contemporary. There's churches that turn into, uh, there's churches that turn into uh, all kinds of things in the world that bring in the rock band, put lights on the stage. You know why? It died out. Old-time religion that gets down in your heart and makes you love the Lord and change your life and go out fearing God and afraid to do wrong is dying in this country. Dying. Don't be a C and E Christian. What's a C and E Christian? Christmas and Easter. Uh, that's on uh, the preacher jumps up on Christmas morning and says, "Happy Easter," because hey, you won't see them again until until uh, 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 Easter time or Christmas time. We're uh, concerning the Savior. You know what this scripture said? This is a this is a shocking thing about this scripture that the Lord said this last church rich increased with goods, got everything in the world. And the, the strange thing is, he is actually on the outside knocking, wanting in. That's a scary thought. Jesus Christ is outside the church knocking in. The average church, if the Lord come today, took the Christians out, a lot of churches would go right on, business as usual, and it wouldn't even hardly bother the way they do things on Sunday. Isn't that awful? The Lord's out. He's out. This church was prosperous. It had money. It had a choir. It had a preacher. It had a baptistry. It had a big offering. It had hymn books. And Jesus Christ was outside saying, Somebody let me in. It didn't say if the church will let me in. He said if just any man. You don't have to sit around and say, Well, I'm going to wait till everybody else gets on fire. And then I'm, if any man hear my voice, the Lord will come right in and sup with you and you with him if you want him to. You know how right with God you are this morning? You're just as right with God as you want to be. And that's a, that's a bad indictment for our churches, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I know, listen, y'all, I ain't fussing at you because I fight the same devil you do. I, you say, well, you're a preacher. It's easy if you, listen, I stayed up last night till 1 o'clock racking my brain. I'm hitting it like that, trying to get my head clear and thought. It was like the devil. I'd try to concentrate. I couldn't pray. I'd, try, I'd read my Bible. I'd put, I'd say, well, I need to pray. And as soon as I pray, I thought I need to study. And then I'd study, and I thought I need to pray. And I thought I need to pray. I'd, I'd like to win nuts like I mean I did this for hours last night just trying to get ready I thought the same devil you do I mean the, the world out there the, the flesh your family the bills your business everything it's just all the time all the time I'm telling you we've got to get back and spend enough time on our knees with God that the fire burn. you don't you're not supposed to have to endure this thing you you get on top of it get the victory enjoy being saved love the Lord Fight the battle. That's the way we ought to be. Not lukewarm at home fire for God. It's not time to resign. It's time to resign. It's not time to give up what you're doing for God. It's time to start all over. So where I go, I meet people saying, well, I'm, like he said burn out a while ago. Technically, there's no such thing as being burnt out doing God's will. It's impossible. You can't get burnt out doing God's will. 
If you get burned out, you're trying to do it in the flesh, or you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. But if you're doing right, there's no such thing as burnout. God will give you grace and strength to do everything He wants you to do. Amen? I'm telling you, brother, this honest to goodness reminds me of that old story. You've heard me tell it before. They said this guy one time, this little old country church, one of them little old mountain churches, way up yonder in the middle of nowhere, and I mean in the mountains. I used to preach to them mountain churches all the time. And I mean them, some of them old people, they love the Lord. And they're, well, they said way up yonder it was on Halloween, and uh, they was having a big Halloween party down the road somewhere, and this guy was dressed up like a devil. And he was going to this Halloween party, and he's walking up the road, had his devil horns on, his robe on. Boy, he's going up through there, and the clouds come over, and it got real dark, and the sky got black, and pow, a big lightning bolt hit, more like that, you know, and everything and there. And I mean, it was scaring the people in the church that night. That night they was in there, and they were saying, oh, my goodness, oh, Lord, what an awful time. And, buddy, I'm telling you what, uh, they, they, uh, they, they were all scared, and about that time a big old lightning bolt hit. And, and everybody got scared. And that devil out there started getting drowned. He started getting soaking wet. And he thought, well, I'm just going to, I'll just duck in this church. And so he opened the front back door and come running in there with that devil suit on. And I mean, it was already lightning and thunder and dark. And all them people started shouting and screaming, running out the back door, jumping out the windows. I don't know that. And he said everybody got gone except one of old deacon. And he got his overhauls hung on a nail on a pew like that. And he's trying to get away. He's trying to get away like that. And, ah! Ah! and, and, and the, the devil came up to him like that. And he said, now, now wait a minute, Mr. Devil. Wait a minute. I've been on your side all along. And I thought, boy, ain't that the way it is. If you come right down to it, there's a lot of Christians been on the devil's side all along. Really. I bet when it really gets bad here in a few years, you might be shocked who quits. And I hope and pray it don't happen in our lifetime, but it looks like things are really going to change in the next 20 years if Jesus don't come. We're going to get a chance to practice what we preach and believe. It's no time to resign. It's time to resign. I'm telling you like the old preacher told a guy one time. He's walking in there and he told about that story of Peter uh, there. And he, he was saying, saying the story of Peter. When the man looked up to him, he said, uh, I need something. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. Rise up and walk. And the preacher got in there and the, and the bishop took him around and showed him all the riches and the gold in the walls. He showed him the stained glass windows. He showed him all the property and showed him all the glamour of the church. And he said, see here, no longer does the church have to say silver and gold have a none. The old preacher looked back at him and he said, no longer can the church say rise up and walk either. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, the great sin of our churches in this country, it's not that we got fault. We know what's right. We know there's a heaven. We know there's a hell. We know there's a God. We know there's a Jesus. It just don't affect us anymore. Lukewarm. Lukewarm. Some of you started out on fire for the Lord. You had a smile on your face. You were excited. I've had people tell me, man, I didn't want you to quit this morning, preacher. Man, I was loving that. About a year later. <whistles> See? Something happened. Something happened. Sin. Guilt. Shame. It's just like our country. Our whole country's gone like this. Let me, let me refresh you about college. You know, they say now you can't even say boy or girl in college. You can't even tell a kid a boy or they're a girl. How, how crazy and ridiculous is that? William and Mary... William and Mary College started off, quote, that the Christian faith may be propagated. Dartmouth College, Dartmouth College was founded to train men to be missionaries to the heathen Indians. Yale University, 1701, was founded for the same reason. 1825, Yale sent out Christian groups to go around and sing the gospel and witness to groups all over the country. Yale. They said, quote, Christ is the only true living way of access to God. Harvard was began to train men to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Princeton University President John Witherspoon said, quote, 
Cursed be all learning that is contrary to the cross of Christ. Cursed be all learning that is coincidental to the cross of Christ. And cursed be all learning that is subservient to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what the founder of Princeton, John Witherspoon, the first president, said? Cursed be 90% of what goes on at Princeton today. They say a horse, a wagon, an automobile, a bicycle, a boat, or a ship can all stop. And some of them can even go backwards. A boat, a horse, a ship, a car, a train can all stop. But an airplane can't. An airplane, when he's up there, he can't stop. Because if he stopped, they say that if you stop, you drop. That's a picture of the Christian life. The second you stop trying is the second you start, start stopping and dropping. The second you cool off, I'm going to tell you something I'm through. Sinners, people that's not saved, are looking for an excuse not to come to church. And the lukewarm Christian is that excuse. Look at him. He ain't no different than I am. He claims to be a Christian. He don't do nothing for him, does he? They use that for an excuse. The big sin of our churches this morning is not, I mean, we believe right. It's just that we don't care or do nothing about it. And I'm going to ask everybody in here this morning as a Christian. I'm going to ask you to say, Lord, make me care before something happens that makes me wish I'd have got right earlier. Lord, break my heart. Make me like I was when I first come to this church, when I loved it, when I was on fire. Lord, do something. Because I promise you, if you don't, something's going to happen down the road that's going to get your attention real quick. Let's don't be guilty of the great sin of churches in America. I want to stay on fire. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, you know, you get to go out to eat. You get to rest. And I, I like to do all that. I enjoy it. We're going to do it today, Lord willing. Have a baptism. Enjoy life. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with, with, with enjoying and, and sports and that, in the right. Ain't nothing wrong with it. I, I play basketball. I run. But I'm telling you, it's easy to get to the place where you just, you don't really care if you win this by the Lord or not. You don't really care if God's real to you or not. That's a bad shape to be in. Let's don't commit that sin, the worst sin of our churches in this country. Let's stand by our heads.